Insomniac Games has given us a gift by mistake. The studio has inadvertently released developer tools in version 1.002 of Spider-Man 2, enabling debug options and level selections that were only meant to be accessible for development use. This offers us a peek under the hood of one of the most technically advanced open worlds in any video game. So let's take a crack at this pre-hotfix Spider-Man 2 patch to see just what kinds of goodies it contains. Can we get a glimpse of early levels? What about performance analysis graphs? And what does it tell us about the inner workings of Spider-Man 2? Let's start out by examining Spider-Man 2's performance metrics tools. Here we can enable a frame time graph with processor load and real time resolution information, and also a frame time histogram as well, if we like. By using these tools, we can access information about how the game is being rendered in real time, without needing to guess or approximate based on the on-screen results. For our purposes, the most interesting readout here is the resolution figures. Spider-Man 2 uses a dynamic res system, with Insomniac's temporal injection technique upscaling the game to its target resolution. That's nothing new, but some of the figures here are a little curious. The fidelity mode at 60Hz output, for instance, seems to have a resolution window of 1296p to 2016p during gameplay, with the game shifting between a handful of resolutions contingent on load. That lower bounds is relatively rare, and the game usually sits at around 1872p in my testing. Even when you aim the camera right at the sky though, a full 4K is out of reach. Interestingly, these resolutions are lower than the resolution ranges we reported at launch, so it's possible there have been some post-release tweaks in subsequent patches, and all of the modes actually seem to have had some resolution tweaks. At 120Hz output, the fidelity mode shifts to target 40fps, and we see an attendant drop to resolution. The top end seems about the same, clocking in at 2016p in very light content, but under load we can go as low as 1152p. In side-by-sides, the fidelity 120Hz mode usually clocks in at a substantially lower pixel count, like in these city views, where the 120Hz variant is at only 59% of the resolution of its 30fps counterpart. In more extreme cases, we see a more meaningful resolution hit as the 120Hz fidelity mode comes in just above 1080p. It's a good reminder that despite the utility of 40fps modes on the consoles, they do require some resolution compromise, even if the uptick in fluidity is worth it. The performance mode understandably brings up the back of the pack, with a 936p to 1440p internal resolution, reconstructed to 1440p. In typical play, we tend to hover around 1152p and 1296p, which produces a respectable looking final image. Interestingly, this mode now has ray traced reflections on all transparent surfaces, which wasn't the case at launch. The addition of RT reflections on these car windows makes the world feel more consistent, though I imagine it carries a resolution penalty. For Insomniac's purposes, 1080p is defined as the default resolution here, with higher and lower resolutions marked in green and orange respectively. The same is true for the fidelity modes, though their default resolution is considered to be 1584p. With all three modes side by side, we can see the typical resolution deltas between each mode. Cutscenes tend to fare best with all three options, with the deepest lows coming during this alpha heavy action sequence in the opening, which we previously identified as one of the game's major stress points. If I show you the full performance metrics for a moment, you can see why dynamic resolution is so helpful here and so effective. Insomniac is pegging GPU load to just fit within the frame time target for each mode, essentially maximizing the amount of pixels that can fit within a given frame time window. It seems very capable, with the game dropping frames marked with these red vertical lines only very occasionally. For an ambitious open world game with ray tracing, the CPU seems well behaved too. In the performance mode, we do sometimes hit CPU-driven dropped frames, but in the other modes, CPU load isn't a problem. Insomniac's frame time graph is fascinating, and it's a great example of the kinds of tools developers use to keep track of performance while playtesting. 
it's very similar to the kinds of graphs we like to display in PC videos, and the real-time resolution information gives us a level of insight into how the game is functioning moment to moment that we really don't get a chance to see in other games. I wish every game had this kind of functionality exposed. And as a bit of a sanity check, I did pixel count a few shots and double checked some of the reported dropped frames and came back with results that matched Insomniac's readout. This appears to be the genuine article, a real working performance graph that accurately logs the current state of the game. Spider-Man 2 does come with a lot of other performance logging options, as well as toggles for basic functionality like texture streaming. Unfortunately, these don't seem to work. Presumably these functions do work in the full debug build of the game, but don't in the production build with the debug overlay that we have access to. We do, however, have access to a lot of extra content that isn't available in the full game, including scrapped levels and areas that aren't supposed to be accessible to the player. For instance, there's an entire mission in Act 2 that seems to have been scrapped, codenamed Meteor, which exists in very basic form here. As far as I can tell, this sequence was replaced by a cutscene in the final game, which covers the same material. There's no skybox, limited environmental art, and basic lighting, which suggests this content was cut very early and didn't make it to late stages of development. We can swing along here, but there's no enemies to fight or anything like that, and the water isn't properly implemented. If we spawn into certain test levels, it's easy to get underneath the world and even go for a little swim. If we jump off the edge of the world, it's actually possible here to start swinging underneath the game environment. And if you look off in the distance, you might be able to see a suspiciously placed cluster of blocks. Get closer and you'll see that these are actually the rooms that are ray traced against to generate Spider-Man 2's window interiors. There are 32 individually labeled pairs of windows and rooms here that are mixed and matched to generate these room environments. It's pretty cool to see these spaces, which are used to generate one of the game's more novel visual effects. There are tons of other interesting little closed off areas that we can access. Certain checkpoints allow you to spawn inside of buildings, for instance. We can enter a lot of broken versions of the open world by spawning in the city during a mission set inside of an interior. There are a couple of test levels set on a flat gray plane with a skybox in the background too, and some cutscenes we can view with a lot of missing assets. We can also access characters we don't usually control in more normal environments, like controlling a plain clothes Peter Parker in the open world, which is impossible in the regular game. We can also simply enable God mode effectively by turning off player damage. Conversely, we can turn off enemy damage, making foes undefeatable. In this scene, I have both enabled, so I never take damage and foes immediately get back up following takedowns. Past this point, I do have to provide a spoiler warning because the rest of the material I have to show you does touch on content from later in the game, so there will be spoilers in this section of the video. I'm not going to go into heavy plot detail, but some content and events do need to be shown here. Perhaps most excitingly, we can actually play as Venom in a bunch of different locations, including the open world. In the main game, this villain is only controllable in short sequences in scripted sections. But by loading into the Venom mission during the Boiler Room objective and modifying the checkpoint, we can play as Venom pretty much anywhere in the game. That includes the Mysterio segments, the high school gym, and the Emily May Foundation. Venom can even go for a dip in the ocean, or perch awkwardly on top of a lamppost. Some of these environments have only very basic lighting and no skybox, while others are just as they are in the regular game. It just depends on the checkpoint. Venom's moveset remains the same though, consisting of jump and dash moves, a basic attack, and a couple of special abilities. His locomotion over the cars here also leaves something to be desired. His moveset will probably be expanded if we see a more Venom-centric entry in the future but he's not really set up to traverse the Spider-Man oriented buildings of New York City as it stands. On the subject of Venom, we can also go into a test version of the Venomified world that we see in the late game. This seems to be a goo-filled iteration of NYC that's been built for testing, though the streaming system isn't working properly and the sky is set to an intriguing red glow. If we load it into the test version of this map using the debug controls, we can get a more complete version of this map with working lighting and streaming if we like. 
In the save menu launcher, this map is called Beautiful Corner, which actually seems like a reference to Beautiful Corner, which is available as a checkpoint in the debug menu. This is actually the street corner that was featured in the opening shot of the very first Spider-Man 2 trailer that we saw back in 2021, though bereft of the effects that made that location look so compelling at the time. If we want to, we can exploit the sequence breaking ability to spawn into any checkpoint during any mission to beat the game with ease. We can simply load into the final sequence, specify mission complete as the objective, and a few minutes later, we're at the credits scene with a trophy for game completion. We can also load up a checkpoint with near infinite resources and a fully leveled up character, giving us the ability to use every suit and ability in the game. Looking to the future, the debug menu contains references to I-34, specifically an announcement trailer, which is likely to be another Spider-Man sequel. And there's a long list of levels for a section about Beetle, which could be DLC for the game. None of the I-34 or Beetle levels actually seem to work in this build though. There's some other interesting material here as well, like how the entire PlayStation Experience demo is accessible here in individual parts, or how it's possible to spawn in the open world outside of boss encounters, or how we can swap times of day with the press of a button. But I think that's a good overview of most of the content I was able to see using the debug functions in patch 1.002. There's bound to be other content I haven't discovered that players may find in the future because the debug menu is vast, but I think that's a good summary for now. So how do you actually access this material? With patch 1.002 installed, you just have to press the touchpad and start button during the game to bring up the debug menu, or press L3 in the save selection menu to bring up a launcher for the game's main content. Unfortunately, patch 1.002 was only briefly available and the debug menu is inaccessible as of subsequent patches, so most people watching this video won't be able to see this stuff personally and those who do have to be vigilant to avoid updating the game. It's best to play it on a spare account if possible though, because you can easily mess up your save games by overwriting them with progression skips. I think it's a great, if unintended, glimpse into the workings of Spider-Man 2 though, with the resolution readout and out of bounds rooms providing some insight into how the game functions. Some of the various tricks we can pull off are pretty cool too, although it's not like there's a vast treasure trove of unused content here. All the stuff that was worth keeping seems to have made it into the retail game. I feel like this is bound to be one of those treasured bits of withdrawn PSN content, like the PT teaser or the pulled Stellar Blade demo from last week. But if you can't access it, hopefully this video has been interesting. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and press the bell for YouTube notifications. Check out the Patreon at digitalfoundry.net for exclusive and early access content. And to get in touch, use social media. Thanks for watching.